today we're going to talk about what I'm calling participatory technology development. Last week in sequence we did the helper and the client one-on-one -on -one for general problem solving. Number two, community development for general community development. Number three, participatory development for general participatory development. Now you as an engineer read those sections and you think of doing engineers, engineering because you're an engineer slash helper, okay? But those are all completely general. They don't necessarily just apply to engineering. They're completely general, okay? Now we're gonna move toward a, a specific case. So in a sense, this is a special case of all of last week's lectures, okay? So now we're gonna start talking about developing um, technology. So this is, this is engineering participatory development. So in a sense, I'm gonna use a lot of the principles from the last three lectures in applying the technology. And there are differences, there are some differences in how you know, engineers approach problems, think about problems, but really they're a special case of that other stuff, okay? So that's what we're up to today. Um, next lecture, we're gonna be getting into more specifics of uh, humanitarian technology, appropriate technology, um, and you know, it'll become even more specific to engineering the rest of this week. Okay, so uh, I, I love this uh, cartoon, Farsight. So humanitarian engineers coming to get to know the community. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Hydro technologies run. Um, so uh, here's an overview of what we're doing today. Um, we're going to talk about assessing user needs for the case of technology. We're going to talk about the design of a technology to meet those needs. And so design is just one part of PTD. Um, when we talk about in engineering, when we talk about development of a, a product, you are not talking about just the design of the project product. The design is one piece of the development. Development is the comprehensive view of design in the sense that it's all the way from user needs to to design, to manufacturing, to marketing, to sales, to distribution, all of that. It's the whole thing, okay? Um, so there's a question as to whether we're going to do manufacturing or not. You may not do that for a particular humanitarian industry case or marketing or sale. We'll talk more about that um, later. Uh, so with one of the challenges here in uh, teaching this subject is there's many types of engineers in the room, okay? So I have to focus a bit um, here. Um, so different technologies demand different development and design approaches. For instance, the software engineering um, in computer science, for instance, sometimes electrical engineering, there's things like the spiral method for software design. We're not doing that here. You could modify all the ideas from the previous three lectures to apply to software engineering, but we're not doing that, okay? Also in civil engineering, you know, there's methodologies to design bridges and buildings. I'm not, I'm not a civil engineer. I'm not talking about that case, okay? Um, those are well-established design methodologies. After you see this done for the case here, and you reconsider the past three lectures, you'll know how to go about it. It's really quite clear. Um, in chemical engineering, for instance, um, there's a lot of chemistry and synthesis, so there's, there's differences too. So the, what I'm, um, there's really no method for all technologies for design, a general development method, unless you get very, very abstract, okay? So what I'm gonna do is focus on products. So products are things like this, like this, like this, okay? Like that chair, okay? It's sort of, it, it's a lot of stuff. It, it does, however, um, tend to be based in certain engineering and not others. So for instance, it tends to be heavily based in mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, electrical engineering, some chemical engineering, sometimes in civil engineering with respect to water and things. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some. So, so there's, there's, it's certain subset of the overall engineering. It's quite broad, but it's not everything. It's not bridges, okay? It's 
not roads. It's not dams. I mean, it's not things like that. Sort of the big um, projects, okay? Um, but if you rely on your discipline, integrate it with the concepts class, you'll have no trouble seeing how to go about this. Um, okay. So this is participatory, and this is so-called human-centered design. That's a, a, a concept of approach of how to approach design, and uh, you know, it's a pretty natural to have things that way. So the community is involved. Um, they're going to emphasize that a lot. We work with the community, not for the community. We put the community in the driver's seat. Um, so the focus is community identified needs and then a technology development team. Yep, put them on the team for the design and have them help put it together, okay? The community plus the outside engineers and other experts are all part of the team and you build relationships. And of course, diversity is important as we, we've emphasized quite a bit in this class. Um, all of this helps create ownership, avoid dependency, avoid paternalism, and it empowers people. All the reasons from before. I'm sure there's other um, words I could add um, there too. Um, so first thing, observe context. So you go, when you go to a community, you can't, you really avoid, you should not avoid, and many times you cannot avoid just like seeing how people live, where they live, um, and seeing the surrounding area and you start to understand some of the constraints then for the technology due to weather, it's rainy season or drought or you know, dryness. You start to understand pretty quick all the constraints you're gonna be running into, okay? And these come in a whole myriad host of ways like houses, um, how the houses are, um, daily activities, the region, the relationships. Um, I think it's great if you can get a chance to eat together learn a lot by eating with someone and socializing. It's very, very useful. Um, and working together. Working together with someone really um, helps you learn about that person and learn about their feelings about things and so forth. And then after you sort of put all this together, I, I talk, I've talked to some people I know that do humanitarian engineering. They feel they need to go live in the village for two weeks to a month before they even start getting a clue about what's going on. Of course, we don't have the chance often to do that if you're only going to go on a spring break, for instance, or a 10 day trip. So that, that's a bit problematic. Okay? But w what you think about it is, is you're supposed to be observing all this time because it's setting context for you. And con context sets design constraints on technologies. Not each and every one, but often it will set a, a, a design constraint. All right, so education. So the community members are the experts on the community and what they want and the context. So listen and learn. In a sense, they are your teachers, okay? It's some t people more than others, of course, but they're your teachers. Now the engineers are experts on some technology and can teach about it. Just by avoiding the math and the jargon, just talk about clear statements, principles of operation that often works good and you build technological Capacity. Um, so you have to be ready to do that. Can you explain SOTUS in very simple terms? Can you explain something else in very simple terms? Okay, um, and uh, I think that's that's something you know everybody has to have in this field a bit of an educator inside of them. Okay, um, that's a very very important skill. You begin building this technological capacity so that they will help you on the project. So you get a collaborative working relationship, and so that if you leave, they can operate and maintain um, the technology. So how do you find uh, opportunities? Now, for some people, remember the social, social business model, opportunity means ways to make money, okay? Um, or um, there's both problems and assets, ones that you can build on. Sometimes there's a generic uh, need area like health or education or a specific need area like water. Um, that, and it may be that it's very easy to learn what the one of the fundamental challenges is. You may get lucky, in fact, that maybe that one of their basic needs is something you're an expert on. That is really great then, right? Because then you have solved what I call the matching problem. The matching problem is there's a set of needs and then there's a team and they got a set of skills 
And you got to make sure that all works together. That's actually can be quite challenging. Okay? Um, and they set the values and needs. I mean, if, if you don't know how to do anything, you walk in the community, you don't say, well, I'll try to do that. You say, you walk away. I mean, if you can't do it, you can't do it, right? I mean, you, you don't want to go in there and screw things up. That can make things worse off for, for the people. So you try to determine the needs, um, and you can select based on degree of match or value. Um, and you want the community input. Well, the question is, of course, should you use participatory action research or PAR? The answer is, of course, you should. Okay. Um, so you might consider existing solutions um, um, for opportunities. And you, of course, you may want the community actually to select. You might work with the community and say, okay, here's your set of needs. Now, what do you want to work on? We, we can work on, you've got five needs. We can work on three of them. Which of the three is of most interest to you? Um, the, they, they, they have to pick, not you. And then they say, well, this is our highest priority need. Let's, let's try to address this. Okay. Um, next, um, you might start planning. Once you, you find out what the need is, you might consider a set of technologies to be developed. Uh, and uh, let's assume in this part that there are new technologies. And they might be new technological solutions to the specific local problems that you've solved. Sometimes you might have off-the-shelf technologies. Okay, I'm going to cover that at the end, that case at the end of the week. I'm going to assume here we need modifications to existing technologies or just new technologies. Okay, so based on the priorities of the community, um, or if you're trying to make money, um, you're going to come up with a, an approach, and usually you have to deal with this issue of whether you have mature versus cutting edge versus uh, some engineers in the industry I've heard called bleeding edge technologies ones that are probably fragile, not well tested, may fail, okay? And uh, you have to start planning things out. You have to start allocating resources. And this is resources in the broadest sense. That means time and money, everything, okay? Figure out how you're gonna go about addressing the need with a technology, okay? Now, the, it says schedule there. You gotta be careful with that schedule word. I've tried to emphasize how much uncertainty there is um, so you develop a flexible schedule, um, take a flexible attitude, and realize that things are always going to go wrong, things aren't going to go how you think, nobody can predict the future, that's ridiculous, and you just go with it, you start trying, and you adjust as you're going. Um, next, you have to identify needs, hosts, hopes, and aspirations. So this is what we talked about with PAR, so you're going to interview individuals or groups, going to have open or closed questions. We talked about that. You want to be inclusive with people and flexible, you know, sort of go for the, go with the flow and find a surprise finds or late needs. Um, sometimes people say that you should use props or pictures. Props means, you know, a, like a little prototype or some kind of a device that you can show them and say, hey, what do you think? Is this a good idea or not? Um, or you show them a picture. Here's a picture of a technology they use in Country X. Do you think that would be useful here? Okay. Uh, it's nice to make it real tangible. Okay. Especially if there's language, com there's communication challenges in the relationship. Um, so, observe the problem and you try to um, find a tech solution that's available. Now, some people say you ought to interview 10 to 50 people. This is very heuristic. Um, what they're trying to say here is don't just interview one. If you want to know the needs for technology, you ought to talk to more than one person. You ought to talk to a number of people so you start to get a sense of, you know, the average need, right? That's essentially what you're trying to find. There's also this concept of lead and extreme users. Lead and extreme users, um, this idea comes from the developed world, and they, but they're or the terminology at least. And these are, these are users that are, that are sort of, might have solved the, the problem themselves with some, maybe even a primitive technology, but it might be brilliant. And you start seeing them use something and you might be able to, you know, replicate it or um, expand on that idea, okay? And if it's, these kind of people can be really useful because then if you work with them, you can say to other people, well, look, 
this person solve this problem with something on their own? Can we do something like that? And then they'll have firm evidence that they're going to get a benefit and they're going to be interested in helping you do that then. Okay. Um, you know, you, you may be a, a, a lead or extreme user yourself. This idea is, is pretty common. For instance, it, it, you know, I'm uh, with my tech guys in my department. I'm often one of the guys that tries something first, uh, some whatever it is, software, and, you know, that causes me problems because then there's more tech problems with that when you're an early user, but you get benefit too. Okay, so, so a lot of engineers are kind of lead users. We push the technology to the edge, too. Um, some people will say that you ought to record these conversations, even videotape them, okay, with a, an end user um, so that more people can see them and analyze them. Or you can come up with some other uh, documentation. Pro. Sometimes videotaping is a little um, invasive with um, people, and they don't like it, so I would be careful with that. So then you have to interpret the community needs information, which can be difficult. Engineers always want to quantify things with numbers and then look at averages and standard deviations, but that often is not useful too. So you might have some things that's quantified uh, with numbers like priorities, level of need, um, other things that are kind of qualitative, right? like based on the user's uh, enthusiasm, for instance, it's difficult to quantify. Um, so then what, what it said is, is you should arrange the needs in the hierarchy with primary needs, secondary needs. Primary need might be something like clean water or water. And then a subset of that is clean water for drinking, maybe not so clean water for showering, okay, or washing your hands. Um, and, uh, and then down the hierarchy you might have um, a need then for a way to get clean water would be some filtration technology. There might be 20 such technologies, and then it goes, you go down like that. Um, getting community input um, through these interviews, you want to find out what the importance of all those needs um, are. Um, and a natural question comes up here is, is can an outsider, such as you, suggest a technology? I would say only if the community strongly affirms the underlying need. Um, so if a, if, a, if a community says, we need this, you study, uh, you've studied, the, you've been an expert in this area a long time, you've studied solutions and say, I think this is a good solution. Sure, you can make a suggestion like that. You're professionally bound to do so. You're an engineer. You have a professional responsibility to, to state your opinion, but you're going to have to justify that opinion. Okay? Um, you got to be careful, though. What about this? They are specifying needs. You're specifying a candidate solution, not this must be done. Okay. Otherwise, it can be what's called paternalistic. And paternalistic is the word that says, you know, father knows best, dad knows best. This is what you do. Kind of attitude. Um, so um, you got to be careful in these situations. Engineers are often uh, are sort of people running around with a technology looking for a solution. Okay. So sort of like. Every, uh, you know, this is their hammer and they hit every nail with it. Um, so that is a bit of a problem. If you learn a lot about, you know, one met water filtration method, you try to apply it everywhere. You really have to have a more professional and broader perspective than not. Okay. Another problem is the so-called technology push rather than pull or supply rather than demand. That's the idea that you, you, you push technologies on people, okay, rather than letting them pull those technologies, buy them or uh, ask for them. Um, and this is a complicated issue in the developed world too. If you think about it, the way technology is developed is with both of these approaches. Um, pull happens when people buy a lot of stuff of, of a technology and then it grows and grows and grows, right? Push happens when somebody just throws out a new technology and it just explodes. Facebook. Right? There was no poll for Facebook, really. I mean, they created the poll and, and they just pushed and, and it happened. It's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. Not, not Facebook is beautiful. The idea is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is, is really amazing that, that that can actually happen. Okay? So once in a while it can. Generally, though, you want to be, have demand rather than pull, uh, push. Um, 
So when can suggestion works? If the technology works well elsewhere in many other countries, um, in some cases the client will not mention a technology since they don't think a solution is even possible. And you realize this is a solvable problem, of course you're going to make a suggestion. Um, another case could be when a client doesn't see a chain of enabling technology. So they, they might um, know about certain things, but like a, a, a good example for this is someone might say, uh, you know, uh, I can't, I'd love to have a cell phone. I could even afford a cell phone, but I don't have electricity. And you can say to them, well, wait a minute. I mean, we can set you up with a charger for that thing, a hand crank charger or a bicycle charger. So they, they may not even dream of being able to have a cell phone because they don't have electricity. And you can say, wait, we can do that, you know. So you're bound in these cases to understand the chain of technologies that can meet a need, like a communication need. And we know that humans highly value communications because there's six billion phone, cell phone subscriptions in the world, okay? So we know that people highly value communications. Um, sometimes you may suggest um, a technology um, that meets a lower priority need, fits the team, but it's their lower priority need. So you say, well, this is what we can do. We, we can't handle. You know, if I go in with a team of electrical engineers, they're not gonna solve a gray water problem, okay? Period, they're not gonna do it, um, most likely. So, so there's, there's, and there's all kinds of cases like that, right? And we all only have certain um, skills. So you're the professional, but they're experts on community needs. What that says is there's a need for collaboration, right? So they understand cultural implications. If the community will own it, in other words, will they buy into this whole thing? Um, question is, how will they react to a suggestion? Will they be polite and simply said yes? I say yes. I've heard of this case before. They don't really want it, but somebody suggests a tech solution. And they say, yeah, we'll take it, hoping that this will fix the problem, or who cares if it fixes the problem? But at least then the person will come back and fix our real problem. Okay, so you gotta be careful with this. Um, you gotta be careful here that you're empowering them, not you. You know, especially as a student, you gotta be careful, especially me, I'm always learning, I, I swear. I mean, that's why I stayed in the university because I could just always be a student. But you know, it, it, it is the case that when you're there, you're like, gosh, I'd like to do that because that's a great challenge, I could learn a lot. No, 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 wrong attitude. You're doing there to help these people, and it has to empower them. And they're going to learn, not you. Okay, you can you can learn with them, though. Um, certainly. Um, uh, so this this issue, this, this delicate balance um, with when to, when to make a, a suggestion versus not. Sometimes you just go with a gut feeling. You know, you just say, "Hey, it doesn't feel right. I'm going to keep my mouth shut." Okay. And sometimes you're going to try it. Sometimes you might wait till later, later on in the day and when you're sitting around chatting with someone and say, hey, you know, I was thinking. And then they say, nah, and then you just say, let it go, okay? I mean, there's ways to, if you're patient, to communicate these sorts of things. Okay, next is usually product specifications. Um, so these are metrics to, um, that we have the measure of the extent to which the technology meets the needs. For instance, in terms of weight, cost, functionality. Uh, but of course, sometimes we won't quantify certain things like aesthetics. So we might aggregate these and have importance ratings um, for these individual metrics and compare these to benchmarks to see what is feasible and establish um, targets for these. You, you people are doing this in, in several of your projects. I mean, you might have some uh, target contaminant level and the output water from some filtration system, right? We're hitting that, we're trying to hit that target. And that's really important as a first thing we're gonna do. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, determine the final specification. So you might develop technical models that are analytical or physical. Some people in class here for the final project are simulating, two, two groups are simulating the systems. Um, may develop a cost model. Cost model means a budget, you know, on a spreadsheet for instance. You might refine the specifications by making trade-offs. You might say, well, this costs too much. I'm going to trade that off against this feature off against this feature. 
and flow down the specifications, the subcomponents, to show that those subcomponents are meeting the specifications, and then determine the cost of subcomponents, etc. So you're trading everything off. Um, next, usually um, this is something your groups have done, um, and that is, is you you had concept generations. I want to do this kind of project, and we could take you know one of n approaches to water filtration or STEM education, and you consider different options. So you clarify the problem, you study issues, you compose the problem sometimes, you search for concepts internally, so you talk to the community, you talk to your group, you brainstorm, and then externally you research it on the internet and so forth. Um, in, the, in the human centered design, um, there's this idea called empathetic design, where you, you have a clear identification with the community's um, uh, needs um, in creating concepts. This is is this word um, in this design concept is is very important. The references are given in the book. Uh, this is empathetic listening, empathetic communication, empathetic presence. Remember we talked about that with the helper client relationship. Um, so then you select products. So the community is going to discuss. They may rate, rank, discuss pros and cons cons, do voting, they may screen concepts. Um, we'll talk more about this later um, on Friday. Um, they'll evaluate different um, concepts and uh, score them. Down select, pick an approach, and that's what you did for your midterm. You picked an approach and said, this is what we're going with, and you move forward, right? So you understand that all of your projects in this class for the final project are product design problems, okay? So you've been doing this all along. So the product architecture, um, there's issue, issues of modularity versus in, having an integral approach. We're going to talk about modular approaches um, on, um, on Wednesday. There's a so-called industrial design, which is sort of the usability, the human interface, safety issues. We we'll talked about engineering ethics in that context. The ease of use, intuitive use, ease of maintenance, appearance, form and color, and and cost, so there's a lot of issues along those lines. Uh, design for environment means you try to reduce the environmental impacts front to back. In other words, from the materials you're gonna use to construct the product to the low pollution operation to end of life issues like how are you gonna throw this in the dump or are you gonna uh, recycle it and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of issues um, there. Um, that has to be taken into account, certainly at every stage. Um, sometimes it can actually improve the quality of the product, actually. You shouldn't assume that you're going to make a lower quality product because it's environmentally friendly. Next, we make prototypes. You've been doing that, right? You made prototypes. Everybody, and I think everybody now, all, all the one team has a functioning prototype right now. Okay? And so this is happening. Um, Prototypes in engineering are not just physical things. They, they also are software or math. Um, so a math prototype means you wrote down mathematical equations like a differential equation and you can analyze something. But then you have computational ones. We do it in MATLAB, right? Simulate. Um, and those are both valuable, but often what happens with engineers is they build it, right? Not like you people are doing. You build the physical thing and show that it'll work, okay? Um, and this can be used throughout the process. A lot of engineers are really good at this part. The, this is like the tinkering part, kind of hack it together and see if it'll work kind of thing. It can be a, a lot of fun, actually, and useful for demonstration, especially when you're working with community. I mean, think of the value of taking a prototype to on your, your let's say, your second trip, maybe. You do all your needs assessment first trip. Second trip, you take a prototype and you say, what do you think? This is what we came up with. And then you improve, 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 and reapply. Hi. Some people would call that a pilot. Um, you try to do robust design. Uh, so there's all kinds of uncertainty. That uncertainty comes from context, right? Context is everything but the technology. It's the person that uses it. It's the, the environment around it, the temperature, the humidity, etc. So the person that uses it could really beat up on it, so it has to be durable. Maybe it's a kid, and they're just gonna, you know, whap, 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 whap. 
you know, or whatever. I mean, you have to be ready sort of for anything, okay? Um, a robust product um, has this parameter set so that in spite of variations, the performance is maintained. That's actually depicted in the upper figure. I won't get into it. But uh, you're always, engineers are always trying to do robust design. I mean, every engineer is trying to do that. Because if you are doing, the opposite of a robust design is a fragile design. A fragile design is one that fall, falls apart. Of course we're not doing that, okay? That's a malfunctioning technology. For all technologies, bridges, everything, hammers, everything. So you're always trying to do robust design, actually, for a technology so that it works under many possible conditions in the real world, okay? Um, economic analysis, you might study cash inflows and outflows, uh, the so-called net present value, which is the difference between those two. That considers also the future. Uh, you might put it together a spreadsheet, do a quantitative analysis. You might do a sensitivity analysis. In other words, you might perturb the product, tweak one feature, see if the cost goes down a lot, and ask yourself, well, will it be the case that if I give up a little bit on one feature, feature's quality, will I get an overall reduction of the whole technology product in costs such that I'm more competitive in the marketplace. That's the way engineers are thinking all the time with respect to design. And uh, <clears throat> you also do qualitative analysis. Uh, there's just times where you can't quantify everything. It's sort of like look and feel. I mean, if you think about it, that's one of the things that Apple does good, in my opinion, is the look and feel of this thing. I mean, it is just, it's cool. It's easy to use, it's, it's cool, right? People say that, you know? It always used to be with Macintosh, you know, my, my buddies would work on a PC, and they'd always say they're working. I would say, I'm playing on my Mac. That's what Mac people always say, I'm playing on my Mac. Isn't that cool? So, sorry, I had to put in a plug for Apple. Um, I don't work for them either. Uh, project management, oh, this is a tough one. You gotta get the group to work together, right? Ouch, you all have learned about that. Not every team learned about that this semester. Some of your teams are very well functioning. Um, as a group endeavor, that means the community and the team. See, the problem is, is you have your, it's a lot worse than your teams in this class, actually. Because you gotta put the community on your teams, right? And then you gotta make it work. So that, that is even harder, without a question. It's gonna be harder, okay? So, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so you can do, you can set up tasks, schedules, perk charge, scan charge, you can do critical path analysis and all this garbage, but if a person isn't gonna do their job, none of that matters, right? So you, you wanna plan, you wanna get people on board, buy into the schedule, but the schedule's gotta be flexible because things will go wrong, but you also have to pay attention to the people problems. People problems are the challenging ones. Next, um, impact assessment. Um, you know, the, I, I emphasized when we talked about Benergy and Dufflow's uh, work in development economics, how nice this uh, randomized controlled talk trials were. And, and uh, you know, I think they're really fantastic um, in the context of humanitarian engineering. They're probably one of the most uh, useful approaches, in fact. So in the simplest case of an RCT, what you do is you just take a bunch of technologies, you put them in a bunch of, with a bunch of people's hands, and you, you, you simply do the following. You simply look at some impact, one variable, for instance, and uh, you let them use it for you know, three months or whatever, and then you come back and you look at that variable and measure it, and then you get a number, and then you get the number across n people, and you take the average of the standard deviation, you have an impact analysis for your technology for one variable, one technology, one variable, okay? That's, it's, uh, that's the kind of thing you would be doing. Um, there's randomization and so forth we discussed earlier in class, I'm not gonna go into it. If you wanna review that, and, and, and uh, I, I would encourage you to go back to Be the Banerjee Buffalo chapter, or simply Google uh, randomized control trials. There's books on it, this, is a, this has been done for years. This is a standard technique in the sciences, in the social sciences in particular. We can also do computer simulations. We've been doing that throughout the class. Um, there, we can do an evaluation, evaluate, compare. We're gonna talk about that on Friday. Um, and you can do qualitative analysis, you know. 
Qualitative analysis generally in this field means you're going to go talk to people and you're just going to interview them and you're going to get their word answers, sentences, paragraphs, whatever. And then you're sort of going to read 10 or 20 of these things and get a sense of what it's about. And that's the qualitative analysis. Okay? No averages or standard deviations and things like that. Next, you want to know if there's unintended consequences and failures. And these things are tough. Um, on the team, there can be social problems on the team. The team can fail to work as a good unit, okay? Uh, that, that's with just the engineers. Then with, with the community people, you could have failures. Um, and so you, you could have a, an engineer offend someone in the community. Um, it could go the other direction too, okay? So there's all kinds of people problems that can happen. Um, there's plenty of unfinished projects, that's for sure. And failures, you know, 10 minutes after you leave, it's not work. I've heard people say that the world is littered with rusty technology from, you know, UN and World Bank projects is typically what they say, but it's not just them. It's a lot of things fail, okay? And it's very, very hard to make sure that something's not going to fail. You don't want it to fail, right? If you're going to put all this work and effort into this, you want to go in, you want it to work for a year, two years, three years, maybe more. You want it to work so that you have an impact. Um, sometimes you can have adverse economic health and environmental impacts. I think it's obvious you can pollute, um, unknowingly pollute. Um, I think the economic ones, sometimes engineers go with technologies and they don't realize that there's a local solution as being sold, they bring in the technology, sell something cheaper, or give it away, and destroy the local market. Put people out of business, and then hurt. Maybe they even hurt more than they helped. So that, that's, a, that's a tough one. Next, um, design for scale. So let's say you have a really effective local solution. You want to have broader impact. This happens. People. They go somewhere and they see it working. They see, they've seen it working for a couple years, maybe even a couple locations. They say, I've got something that works. This is really going to have an impact. The problem is, is how do you scale it up? In other words, how do you scale it up to the country level or to the region level or to the world level of technology? This is really hard um, because you might need to construct conduct a wide area par, which can be very difficult. It might require you to interview a thousand people. That's not easy. You have to do design for manufacturing. This is a well-known concept in the engineering. You may have to redesign your product so that it's easy to manufacture. Or you can manufacture it really inexpensively so it's still a robust product. And then you have to disseminate. There seem to be only two approaches to dissemination. Dissemination means you take your technology and you get it out there everywhere. So there seems to be two drivers for this. It's aid, you know, UN, World Bank, whatever. Just uh, get it, subsidize it or give it away and spread it around. Or you pick, set up a business, okay? Now I call this thing participatory social business. I've never heard the term before, but it makes sense to me. In other words, what you do is, is you don't, you know, sit back in the US and, and make tons of money off of selling things to poor people, what you do is you teach people in the other country how to make money off of each other and sell the product to each other. Okay, so you teach them business skills. Like Paul Pollock said, I mean, we need to teach people business skills so they can make money so they're not poor. Okay, um, so this, this sort of idea um, actually makes a lot of sense, I think, is, is working with locals to start um, businesses. Maybe you'd get a cut. Fine, but put them in the driver's seat. Okay? That's all I have.